yeah, uh, this presentation this week that we're really super glad that they're here for that they're here to share with us is uh, Stephanie Tran and um, and Sharon Sharon Kayla. Um, and uh, Stephanie is a policy analyst with the Cybersecure Policy Exchange at Ryerson, and um, Sharon is a, a master's of public policy administration student at Ryerson, who's currently working as a policy and research assistant with the Ryerson Leadership Data, super, super cool organization. Uh, um, and they're here to speak and share with us on uh, critical infrastructure and cybersecurity at the local municipal level, which is so important because like, at least at the federal government, there's like 30% of IT jobs that are unfilled, including cybersecurity. Uh, we definitely, it's a very much needed <laughs> focus area, especially in kind of the, you know, the, the crises that are, that are on going right now. Um, so I, with that, I'm, I'm super excited to just pass the, the mic to both of you. I will unshare my screen. Nope, I don't need to. You already got it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, Pat Khan. And thank you so much, Civic Tech Toronto, for inviting us today. Special shout out to Skydra for reaching out to us and for doing all the incredible work that you do. Um, like Pat Khan said, I'm Stephanie, and I'm here today with my colleague, Sharon Kayla. And for the past year and a little bit more, we have been doing research as part of the Cybersecure Policy Exchange, looking at how in Canada, how our municipalities can have their critical infrastructure to be made more cyber resilient. So to be strong and secure from cyber attacks. Now in Canada, municipalities build and maintain around 60% of the entire country's core public infrastructure and in Canada, when it comes to our water treatment and distribution, a lot of that is done by municipalities. So I will hand it off to Sharon, who will delve into how critical infrastructure has become increasingly connected to the internet and the cybersecurity concerns have arisen as a result of that. Well, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and thank you for inviting us today. So before we get into the meat of our report and our findings, um, we'd like to just clarify what we mean when we say terms like critical infrastructure and resilience, just because we'll be saying these continuously throughout our presentation. So critical infrastructure are systems which are essential to our health, safety, security, economic well-being of all Canadians, and also for the effective functioning of our government. So this includes our electricity systems, water, transportation, and such. Uh, critical infrastructure resilience is the capacity of our system to adapt and maintain an acceptable level of functioning and structure in the face of hazard exposure. So such as cyber attacks and how quickly are we able to respond to cyber attacks and do we even have the capacity to do so is what we were kind of trying to figure out through our findings. Um, operational technology is hardware and software that is used in these systems to monitor and control processes and devices. These systems have increasingly become connected to information technologies, so IT systems, in order to increase automation, facilitate remote monitoring, and drive efficiency, which is why techniques like air gapping aren't really as reliable as we once thought that they were as well. So regardless of the benefits, the connection of operational technology to the internet has critical infrastructure systems much more vulnerable to cyber threats now. So a large challenge which is faced by municipalities is their lack of access to funding, and which is really needed in order for them to meet the resilience needs of their critical infrastructure. Municipalities across Canada are struggling to collect these funds, which are necessary to repair, replace, and protect their critical infrastructure from physical threats, no less digital ones. And as I'll be dis discussing later on, um, aging infrastructure and such, and the shortage of, of cybersecurity talent are also large concerns as well faced by municipalities, but our natural our national infrastructure def deficit is estimated to be between 150 billion to $1 trillion. And on top of that, we also have issues, external issues like climate change, which are further constraining infrastructure budgets with municipalities requesting help from the federal government to fund climate mitigation and resilience projects to protect their infrastructure. There is currently an underinvestment in municipal critical infrastructure, which is precluding important investment for advancing their cybersecurity. And a lot of the issue is also trying to convince um, individuals at higher levels that this is an issue that needs to be addressed, which is something that we heard through our interviews as well. Um, so a hefty investment is needed to fix and protect municipal critical infrastructure from physical threats, but it's difficult for municipalities to dedicate adequate funding for their critical infrastructure cybersecurity. So as I mentioned, um, aging infrastructure is a large issue along with um, the shortage of talent. So there is a lot of cost associated with repairing and replacing legacy systems and aging infrastructure. The systems that are being used today, these legacy systems and OT systems and cyber threat actors will continue to target these systems 
until they are replaced since they're very outdated. But rural municipalities are especially struggling to replace and update aging infrastructure due to the lack of funding and resources that they have. And another challenge that municipalities and the OT industry are facing is the significant shortage of security labor. Our interviewees emphasized the need for more cyber professionals in the field. And this IT talent, the lack uh, of IT talent is also occurring more so in smaller and rural municipalities. And this capacity to hire and retain talent will differ between different municipalities as well. So I'll now hand it over to Stephanie to discuss our jurisdictional stand. So you can see um, or find more details on this jurisdictional scan in our final report. Um, I'm just going to go through it really quickly. And what you can see is unfortunately a lot of red squares, meaning that in the 10 provinces of Canada, there's a huge absence of provincial regulations and guidelines that include cybersecurity when it comes to the issues at hand. So when it comes to critical infrastructure operations, emergency management, procurement, and asset management. What you can see here, at least what stands out the most is the middle column, where it's showing that there's a lot of cybersecurity guidelines uh, for energy distributors in Canada. And that's because all the provinces, except for Newfoundland and Labrador and PEI, they are mandated to follow NERC critical infrastructure protection standards. And some of these include cybersecurity requirements. So what we're seeing is that the energy industry, they have been taking active steps in finding ways to get critical infrastructure operators to you know take uh cybersecurity considerations at hand and sharon is going to talk about how in ontario um this has come through in terms of a regulation that has been active in Ont in the province for several years now yeah so as Steph just mentioned um the ontario energy board has undertaken some work to secure energy infrastructure from cyber threats. In 2016, the OEB convened members of the energy sector to develop the Ontario Cybersecurity Framework, which provides a common basis for uh, transmitters and distributors to assess their level of cybersecurity risk, their maturity level, and their compli compliance to legal privacy requirements and privacy principles. Uh, a provincial legislation was also passed in 2018, which mandated that Ontario's energy transmitters and distributors will have to annually report on their cybersecurity maturity and pr privacy protections. Um, this framework and subsequent regulation was developed, keeping in mind that the capacities, needs, and maturity levels will range between infrastructure operators. So Ontario's distributors are not exactly required to fully comply with the framework per se. Instead, they are required to report how they measure against the framework and set cybersecurity objectives depending on their level of risk. Several of our interviewees shared that they've noticed many positive developments since the framework's implementation, sharing that Ontario's energy sector is now definitely in a better state of readiness, readiness prior to this framework. Um, and at the same time, since organizations though are not required to fully comply with the cybersecurity framework, one roundtable participant noted that energy sector, that our sector still has a long way to go in securing their systems. And there's probably only a very small portion of Ontario's energy sector organizations which have fully met framework standards. So one point that was consistently emphasized by municipal IT leaders was the significant impact that municipal leaders and councils have over cybersecurity initiatives. Councils and management that are more aware of cybersecurity and prioritize it are more likely to support cybersecurity work and necessary investments, which is why I previously mentioned that individuals at higher levels and executive levels need to kind of be convinced that there is a problem and for them to communicate this is can be troubling and difficult at times. Um, another development that has brought improvements to municipal cybersecurity, however, has been cyber insurance. Since these incidences, as we've been discussing, have been increasing in scale and frequency, local governments have been increasingly seeking cyber insurance to mitigate themselves from risks. But the issue is, in order to qualify for this insurance, so organizations need to have adequate cybersecurity procedures in place in the first place. Um, and this has motivated municipalities, encouraging them to adopt better cybersecurity practices and policies in order to qualify for coverage. So I'll now pass it over to Steph to go over provincial mandates and guidance. So we have five policy recommendations. And the first one is for provinces to enact regulations and to enable uh, or to provide guidance as well to their local governments. And this is because provinces are the most direct line to municipalities. It is at the provincial or territorial level from which municipal critical infrastructure systems like water, energy, and transportation are largely regulated by in Canada. Um, we felt that a good model to follow 
would be the OEB cybersecurity framework. So having an industry specific cybersecurity framework that entities can measure themselves against by, but not necessarily have to fully comply with. And that is in recognition that we don't want to overburden municipalities with regulation. And indeed the round table participants, they were contending with the fact that like, you know, we want regulations with bite, but at the same time, you don't want to overburden municipalities. So this was one way to kind of compromise that. At the same time, the cybersecurity framework, it really encourages regular risk assessments, which are absolutely key to comprehensive cybersecurity, but at the same time, they're expensive. So enacting regulations, it gets um, municipal leaders and councils to you know, have more support for dedicating funding to cybersecurity. It improves the business case. But at the same time, any regulation that is implemented needs to also have funding um, introduced alongside it so that municipalities can you know, meet these requirements. Another thing that needs to be provided is clear provincial guidance, because within each province, they have different jurisdictional laws and regulations, and local governments are still trying to scramble with understanding what their expected behaviors are. So one good example of a resource is the AMO's Municipal Cybersecurity Toolkit, and there they lay out the relevant laws and regulations and advice and available resources. Our interviewees, they also shared that they want guidance on how to do communication strategically during incidents. As one person said, you don't want to figure out those questions in the middle of a crisis. With rising ransomware incidents, communications or public communications is something that attackers can use in terms of their negotiations with their victims. So having a set plan in place with how municipalities should communicate during ransomware incidents, for example, is a huge thing. Participants also emphasize data governments and privacy, and that includes Steve, who is here today with us. Um, it's absolutely fitting, especially in this topic, because sensitive data on operational technology systems, it can be used by attackers for designing their attacks. Now, like we said, there's increasing supply chain attacks. So procurement absolutely needs to be updated to ensure due diligence of vendors and um, vendor selection and validating them. And ways to help with this would be directory of vetted vendors so that instead of each municipality dedicating resources as silos, they could work together and collaborate to create um, you know, a list of vetted vendors. There's also the possibility of implementing shared service agreements, which can allow lower costs between all of the municipalities, and also implementing cybersecurity clauses and all RFPs to ensure that vendors are following industry cybersecurity standards. And of course, funding, because it's so important that municipalities have the resources to implement these uh, cybersecurity requirements. And that also includes being able to meet market rates for the super competitive cybersecurity labor market right now. Um, investing in infrastructure resilience can see a return on investment of $6 in future averted losses for every $1 spent. And when we're talking about cybersecurity, well, cybersecurity breaches are extremely expensive. So what we really emphasize in our paper is a need for dedicated funding for cybersecurity. Because when we're talking about infrastructure resilience, there's hugely competitive costs in terms of, in terms of you know, climate change and aging infrastructure. So we need to make sure that cybersecurity gets the funding it needs in the budgets that are created by municipalities. And lastly, a uh, recommendation is for training for today's staff and tomorrow's as well. So municipalities, like all organizations, um, need to foster a culture of cybersecurity where cybersecurity is prioritized among everyone especially, especially when it comes to the top of the organization. And that includes ongoing cybersecurity training and um, you know, just getting municipal leadership on board to understand that cybersecurity needs to be prioritized. And of course, also to attend to the pipeline problem of labor, implementing more training and reskilling programs or at least you know, further supporting ones in existence so that uh, in the future we can have you know, the labor that we need, but also to help the smaller municipalities and utilities that are struggling to compete for IT talent. So again, thank you so much Civic Tech Toronto and to Skydra, to Sharon, to everyone. Um, we're so glad that this research is out in the world, especially right now during this geopolitical climate where 
um, cybersecurity attacks or cyber attacks against in infrastructure, the risk is even higher right now. Um, so please feel free to let us know of any questions you have. And I'd love to continue this discussion with everyone. So thank you.